Hello, everybody. Which tap am I drinking from? This one. <clears throat> Everyone drop a comment so I can see who's here, please. So I can say hello. Ah, cheers. Oh, okay. Hey, Bill, how you going? Hey, Brett. <coughs> oh, hope everyone's well this evening. <sighs> What's on the agenda? <laughs> so we've got a heap of questions um, that we've already got so far that honestly I think are probably going to cover the majority of the stuff that we're going to be talking about tonight. Um, but um, this is essentially a deep dive into protein skimmers or foam fractionators as we call them in the commercial side of the industry, uh, one and the same thing. And so that everyone can get a deeper understanding of how they work, how they should work, how they are designed or how they should be designed. Um, why is someone calling me about a live stream? That makes no sense. Um, Derek Ong just called me about the live stream. I don't, I've never got that before. Um, yeah, that's weird. Anyway, so um, yeah, we're going to uh, we're we're essentially uh, it's it's going to dissect the uh, design, application, sizing, and operation of protein skimmers or foam fractionators, and I'll use those terms interchangeably. Um, and uh, try and give everyone um, try and give everyone a little bit better understanding of uh, what the go is. So yeah, I'm really good, Bill. I am really good. Um, yeah, this I, I go back. I'm still on leave. I go back to work on the 28th, and I, oh, I got to tell you, it's going to be hard. <laughs> I've definitely enjoyed the time I've had off with uh, with Vera, my my daughter. So um, yeah, it's it's been really good. I've been able to reset. It's awesome. So yeah, I hope I hope you've been well. Um, so before, look, we've got half an hour and I'm happy for you guys to sneak in any last minute questions before we get the stream started. Um, I will be answering everyone's questions in the event chat, uh, where I posted the event first. However, uh, if anyone has any particular questions, um, that they'd like to slip in last minute, um, by all means, feel free. What, uh... What beverage is everyone enjoying tonight? Anyone that hasn't been here before, this is a very relaxed environment. Um, you know, we're here to have fun as well as learn something. It's by no means formal. Um, so, you know, banter is encouraged. Um, and uh, yeah, if you, if you want to sit back with a beverage, by all means. Um, of course, if you're of age, too. <laughs> um, you know. By all means, sit back. We're all adults here. <clears throat> Captain Morgan, we have a rum fan on hand. Okay. I myself uh, like the Jamaican, um, uh, the Jamaican rums, the real funky sort of rums. Um, 
don't ask, don't ever serve me Bundaberg. I siphoned crap out of the fishbowl for a li- out of the bottom of the fishbowl for a living for quite a few years. Um, I know what Bundaberg rum tastes like. So let's. Uh... Oh my god! What? Stop calling! Why is he continuing to call me? Do you know who this Derek Ong bloke is? I've got no idea. I've got no idea. But, but he says he's calling me to join the stream. I don't understand. Okay. Um, what? What? My room? No. What? This is weird. This is really weird. Let me... <clears throat> This makes no sense. Stand by, we're having some technical difficulties. Um, I know where I, I think I saw that. Uh, vents. How long the... I have no idea what that is. Anyway, look, I'm forgetting about it. Let's move on. It's a trap. Um, yeah. Uh, myself, I'm enjoying a lovely uh, hoppy pale ale that I've brewed myself. Uh, and I did this as a dry. Um, so I put some uh, Gluca MLS enzyme in it to, to bring it right down so that it, it didn't have as much uh, leftover unfermentable sugar in it from the malt. Um, it finished very low on the specific gravity, so it's it's quite a dry beer, very sessionable. It's really nice. It's different anyway. Let's put it that way. Ah. Ah. Right, we've got eight people and I think four have said hello. Brett, hey young man, what's going on? What uh, brain cell killer are you enjoying tonight? What's everyone been up to? I've been out of the loop. Fill me in. What's going on? Uh, we've had some good action from the APAC, from, from in the APAC committee. Um, working on some stuff. Uh, some action from the NRAA, which is fantastic for the new species. Um, I'm not sure exactly where that's up to, but for those who don't know, I'm... I'm Sure, if you read Paul's post with the PIAA and also Aquarium Industries uh, also um, put up some money as well, which was fantastic. Ah, oh, Reese, how are you going? What beverage would you be enjoying tonight, my friend?
Okay, finally found out who it was. It was Derek E I C Ong. Derek Ong. Um, and I believe, if I am not mistaken, that um, <clears throat> I'm not sure, but I believe Derek has something to do with. Why are you ringing me? Stop calling! Oh my god. Ah, uh, okay. Look, I'm just... Stand by, people. <clears throat> Hello, Campbell. Oh, Reese, you need to learn some self control. But I understand. <clears throat> it's easy to do sometimes, <laughs> especially when you're having fun, eh? God, it is warm. I'm wearing a jumper. That was a rookie error. It's really warm. I'm probably going to open a window. Here we go. Stand by. Jeez, oh, crap everywhere, and I've only been living here for five months. Oh, right. There we go. 12% bourbons. Oh, like pre-mixed can jobos. Righto. Mm. I got some lovely, beautiful um, Jack Daniels single barrel select, 45%. Um, oh my god, stop calling! Still having some issues here, so just let me. I can. Sorry, swear words. Um, what? What is it? What? What? Here we go. Andrew, how's the clownfish breeding business going? <sighs> so as last time, guys, uh, we are still 20 minutes out, so we're just talking, chatting. Uh, <clears throat> throw some stuff up in the group and we can uh, chat ad, ad lib uh, on unrelated subjects if you guys want to um, before the live stream starts or as I said if, if anyone has any particular questions on phone fractionators um, by all means throw them in last minute and I'll put them on my list Glasses has got a hole in the bottom of it. <laughs> Hello, Trent. Everyone, Trent Fish. Oh my god. Oh my god. I don't know how much clearer I can make it. I'm sorry. I'm losing my cool. I'm sorry. It's been a long week. 
Trent, how you going, man? Can someone please throw up the link? Can someone please throw up the link to the live stream under the message to Derek Ong that I put in the group, please, as a reply message to that? so that he can click on it and get into it. That would be super, because I can't do it from this computer because it'll screw up the live stream, and I'll be, but actually no, I can do it. Never mind, oh, I know boats, it's okay. Um, more. Oh, wait. <clears throat> um, how do I do this? How do I do this, how do I do this? Um, Post so no. Um, It's okay. <laughs> I think we've got a sort of trait. What's going on? You finished work for the day, obviously. You're knocking off for the weekend. <laughs> oh, my kid. The maintenance guys don't work on the weekend. Oh, you guys got it easy. <laughs> <laughs> What's going on, bro? How you doing? Derek, throw a comment down in the bottom so that I know you're here. Hello, Bruce. I'm nearly finished writing up that stuff for you, man, so I'll have that to you probably early next week. Just beer has been a bit of a handful, and I've had some other stuff I've had to deal with. I apologise. What are you sipping on, Trent? A nice, cold, great northern, or some other sort of cane toad swill? Hey Derek, lovely to see you. We made it. We got there, bud. This is awesome. Uh, exchanging brood stock. What do you mean by exchanging brood stock? As in swapping them around and pairing them up for spawning, or swapping them in and out uh, of your breeding program? <coughs> Starting to have more words than holes is definitely a step forward, I find. Um, if in, I don't know whether you run into this problem, Bruce, but if in doubt, just start writing an e just write it into a, like a new email, and it'll just the the, the the dribble just falls out of me when I'm writing an email. So I don't know if that's going to work for you, but maybe that's a tip. Instead of putting it in a Word document. Maybe just throw it into a new email and it'll just all come spewing out. Maybe try that. It works for me. That is half my job. <laughs> Honestly, it's just dribbling. Not really. I can make it sound convincing, let's be honest. <laughs> hmm. <clears throat> Anyone got any news about what's going on down in... Coronaville down south. How the uh, the stores are hanging in there. What do I want to drink? I'll have the other one this time. This is what happens when you have warm taps, people. You get ice creams. <clears throat> I hope everyone is refreshed and getting hydrated. Because this is gonna <laughs> Oh, this is more controversial than your spaghetti bolognese recipe this stream. This is gonna whew, This is yeah. 
Protein skimmers, man. I, d I honestly don't know why I did it to myself, but hey, let's just... I might ruffle some feathers. <laughs> just saying, full disclosure, okay? Full disclosure. Okay, that's better. That's better. Fuck off, will ya? That's what you want. Oh, god damn, that's delicious. Sorry. Okay. Oh, wow. What's going on here? Hey, hey. Melbourne in lockdown until at least the 28th. Regional Victoria got their freedom a couple of days ago. Well, well. That's good for the guys up at uh, the border, um, Albury, Wodonga. Um, we got some friends at CSU there that have been very isolated um, from only like 10 kilometres across the border, which kind of sucks. Good for them, I suppose. Everyone just needs to wear a mask and be uh, sensible, and we'll all get through this in no time at all. <sighs> you on cold ride, Bruce, or have you got a night off? Reese, can you remind me where you work again too, please? I've forgotten. I've got a terrible memory and I've met so many new people through these streams of late that I can't remember who's told me what. <clears throat> oh, by the way, Derek, um... Are you involved in building protein skimmers by any chance? <laughs> the community. Yeah, just walk down the street. Here's a hose. Suck on it. <laughs> just get that ozone in you. Um, surprisingly, um, if it was in the lungs, that might actually have some benefit, depending on concentration. Uh, we always talk about um, concentration versus toxicity here. So it's... Um, Derek, do you build the skims, protein skimmers? Is that where I know you from? Oh, just hobbyists. Well, we love hobbyists. We love hobbyists. We love you guys getting involved. It's fantastic. Reese, please, if you have other people on other pages or on your friends list, that you think might be interested in this, please send them the link. We would love to have them. Um, the more people we get exposure out with these live streams, the more people that get the message from uh, the Paul Talbot is trying to, um, to, to get across here and unite the industry, um, the better. So if you have, yeah, and that goes for everyone here, if you have, um, you know, anything uh, that you can post on pages and so forth, please feel free to go ahead and do so. <clears throat> okay, so my comment actually came from ozone therapy and hydrogen peroxide therapy that does have actual research behind it that has been proven to be effective against some viruses. Um, in no way would I ever condone um, injecting uh, Demesos or any other <laughs> disinfectant related product um, by way of injection. I mean, I'm not a doctor. You'd have to ask a doctor. <laughs> oh, girl, what a twit. Oh, you are, Derek. Oh, oh. right. That's fantastic. I've been a fan of octopus products for a long time. Um, 
I knew Joe Tran very, very well. Um, sadly, we all know what happened there. Um, and uh, I met the I don't know old guy that started Reef Octopus that now works in Cubic Systems. I have his card at work for the life of me. I can't remember what his name was. Um, but yeah, fantastic. Um, Derek, it, it, look, I would love to talk to you um, outside of this stream at any point if you did have any questions. Um, I love to, to get to know um, you know the, the manufacturers and builders of these uh, particular you know uh, highly respected brands um, and a lot of the stuff that you guys are doing is 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 really really good really nice so um, yeah anytime you want to chat man just let me know can't share from the group well that um, sucks can you invite them to the group, invite them to the group, and then tell them about the stream. Try that. I'm getting everyone to do the work for me here, but then again, it's not my group, so I can do that. Um, what do you mean, not sticking your UV bulb in places? It should. Oh, <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, well, it's just through the respiratory tract, so, I mean, you've got a long way if you're going in the opposite end to get there, Andrew, but by all means, try if that's what you've got on your mind. <laughs> Martin, that's it. Thank you, Derek. I've remembered now. Martin, top-notch guy. Um, yes, fan fantastic. Can't wait to start reef, Jesse, as in a reef tank, or reef diving, or reef fishing, or reef, I've got nothing else. I was thinking, I was trying, I, I don't even know, I don't even know this one. <clears throat> UV tubes are too long, yes. Yeah, well, this is this is an open group for anyone who wants to join. So by all means, if anyone knows anyone in groups that would like to join this group, um, I know Paul wants more people to join this group. So invite them if you have them on your friends list. I think anyone can do that. I don't know. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and then they can look at the stream. I haven't got around to it yet. I have been downloading these videos so that I can upload them to my YouTube channel. And I have actually been thinking about getting a decent headset and a decent camera to do better live streaming. So that's on the cards as well. I don't quite know when, um, but it's on the cards. You know, because we want to keep this thing going. We want to. The, the, the more we do, the more momentum this keeps to have. This this keeps having. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, it's been it's been a long week, guys. You know how women talk about their baby brain. I always used to think it was bullshit. It's not. It's definitely not. Baby brain is a very very real thing. <clears throat> You're drinking tax deduction, Trent? I've never heard of that before. Is it satisfying? As tax deduction usually is? I don't know. Ooh, we've got two minutes till we start. Two minutes. We might wait till about five past eight just to let 
um, you know, other people get here. I can never, it doesn't tell me who, Facebook Live needs to fix their shit so that I can see who is actually on. <laughs> the myth, the legend, Mr. Matt Bates is here. Jesus, what's going on, brother? How are you? Look, no one is actually good at Facebook, Reese, let's be honest. Um, <clears throat> yeah, no one, no one's good at Facebook. Ugh. <clears throat> What's going on, Matt? No night shift tonight, I hope. I hope you're able to enjoy a beverage with us. Mate, I don't have a business. Um, yeah, I don't have a business. It would be... <clears throat> look, look, at this point, it's go and buy a better camera and a headset or go to Bunnings or Home Brew Shop. It's a very, it's a very difficult decision. Yes, I have had a few weeks off. Yes, definitely. Um, I go back on the 28th, which will mark 10 weeks. So I think I've been off for about eight now. Um, 10 days I'll go back and I'm really starting to get depressed about that. I wish I'd taken another four, honestly. I really wish I'd taken another four weeks. But look, let's, uh, there's other reasons for that. We're having problems finding care for Vera and it's all, it's, yeah, it's a, a whole thing it's yeah it kind of sucks at the moment actually but look we'll get there we'll get there <clears throat> Matt what are you sipping on I hope you're here for the whole stream I hope you don't have to duck off halfway through for work I'll get my questions up while we're going. Oh, look, President Trump has tweeted again. <laughs> hey, hey. Oh, if you don't laugh, you'll cry. Uh, we'll that was strange. Okay. Events, uh, calendar, right. Yes, that, and uh, right, questions. Beautiful. Um, by the way, Sorry, I can't, I can't do two things at one point. What is going on here? C-H-R-I-S. There we go. <laughs> oh, look out, the young fellow's in trouble. Oh, look, I'm just tagging everyone who's asked questions. Tag away, people. Tag away. We need people in here. People need to uh, get in here and ask some questions and have some fun. And Oh, shit. I've got to tag John. Bugger. Half 
I get to tag Mr. Bailey. Ugh. Right, we'll give it a couple more minutes. <clears throat> See if um, anyone who... Um... Oh, I'm just remembering. Everyone here... <clears throat> um, give her a couple more minutes to get in here. We're in no rush. Yes, shoot away, Bruce. It's it's not even eight o'clock yet, as far as I am concerned. So, yep. If you have a question, far away. Oh, I drastically need better posture. Ugh. A chair, I think, would probably help. <laughs> All right, it's five past. If they're not in here yet, they'll just have to catch up. Right. Okay. <clears throat> so. 8 o'clock was the start time. 7.30 is the warm-up. 8 o'clock is the start time. But, okay, so... Um, oh, Zoe, you're only five minutes late. I won't hold it against you. Um, what are we drinking tonight, Zoe? What wonderful concoction are you going to surprise me with tonight? Contro and prune juice or something wild like that? <laughs> I can't remember what the last one was, but it blew my mind. Um, are you having a beer, Andrew? Anyway, I'm going to start. Um, okay, so tonight, Protein Skinners, um, probably, there is probably no other more controversial subject out there than Protein Skimmers. Um, I'm not going to tell you one brand is better than another tonight. I'm not going to single out brands. I may mention brands to highlight different um, features that I am uh, talking about. Uh, but in no way am I am I um, you know promoting those. I, I may uh, full disclosure. We sell RK2 protein skimmers or foam fractionators. So I may mention them, um, but uh, in, in no means this is a sales pitch. So let's just yeah. Um, but what I what what this is to do is to 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 give you guys the facts and how to go about looking at sizing, um, applying, researching the different options for protein skimmers or foam fractionators out there on the market so that you can make a better informed decision and honestly i think the status quo probably needs to change because there is a lot of shortfalls in a lot of protein skimmers on the market today that simply just need to be refined so look we'll we'll start as things um as things go along we will uh, We'll fly by the seat of our pants like we always do, huh? Um, I better get another mid. Just bear with me here. I think my gas is running out and um, CO2 gas on my beer keg. Let's keep it clean. And uh, it's taking a little longer to pour a beer than you. Um, but having said that, it's not a froth factory either, so I can, you can only be thankful, honestly. Disarono. Remind me what Disarono is again, Zoe. <clears throat> okay, so there is no set script, no set order to what we're doing here. Um, uh, okay, beauty. Um, I'm, I'm thinking that Julian is in the chat. He liked my tag, so I'm thinking he's here, but he hasn't said hello yet, which is honestly quite rude, Bags. I mean, come on, Badger. Get your act together, mate. Jeez Louise. Oh. <laughs> oh, what? 
I'm not even going to comment. I'll leave that up to bloody. I'll leave that up to Rob Lansley. Armin Lequeur. Ugh, I'm getting distracted. I'm getting distracted. Okay, so um, I need to. Here we go. All right. So let's start from the top. <laughs> hey, man. Wonderful to see the lab up and running. Um, for anyone that doesn't know, obviously you've probably been living under a rock, but um, Julian and Hassan finally have the Triton ICP testing lab up and running in Australia, which honestly is probably one of the most exciting things to happen to the Australian aquatic industry in the last five years honestly guys like you now have the testing that you all deserve and need right on your doorstep so there's no more excuses to not getting it done um and julian we still need to talk we haven't set up that meeting yet about that um when i get back to work maybe on the 28th so try it out, guys. Uh, very exciting. Very exciting stuff. Very exciting to see some uh, to see some innovation hitting the Australian shores. It's awesome. Um, okay, so let's start with the questions, and I'm going to work on my way from the top down because uh, the people who ask the questions first deserve to have their questions answered first. So let's have a crack. Um, Max Sloman asked, uh, Foam fractionates, are we going to see smaller versions of them in the future, like protein skimmers, like we have seen protein skimmers, or can we expect them to remain more of a semi-commercial application? So I went on to ask whether he's speaking about foam fractionators or whether he's speaking about dissolved air flotation. And it was dissolved air flotation that he was talking about. So let me... Let me uh, differentiate the technologies. So protein skimmers, generally speaking, generally speaking, are the smaller models that are applied to aquarium applications. Foam fractionators are larger units, what, uh, what larger units are called, um, generally speaking, quote unquote, in the commercial sector. I'm talking about oceanariums, I'm talking about large quarantine systems, I'm talking about aquaculture systems, okay? So, um, <clears throat> now having said that, some people still call them protein skimmers, and some people mesh the two together and call them protein fractionators. <laughs> They're one in the same thing. They're a tube, they've got a collection cup on the top, you inject air in the bottom, you flow water in, it collects all the crap, floats it up out of the cup, you know the deal. Dissolved air flotation takes that same technology and tweaks it for the wastewater industry. Well, not actually tweaks it, turns it completely on its head, really, for the wastewater industry. So dissolved air flotation is still using bubbles to attach to pollutants and contaminants to float them to the surface, okay? The difference is, is that dissolved air flotation predominantly is used in fresh water and the contaminants are so much higher, so very, very high, that, you know, it's, it's contaminated water. It's, it's, it's sewage water, right? It's, or it's, you know, loaded with heavy metals, or it's a pulp mill, or anything like this. So they want maximum bang for their buck. So what they do <clears throat> is they suck in air at incredible pressures. And I'm talking, like... 50 to 100 psi, compress it, and then when they release it into the dissolved air flotation or the DAF unit, which is, it's not like a protein skimmer or a foam fractionator that we see, that we know. It's like a big box, a big rectangular unit that has a, um, uh, a, a chain that goes and like rotates the length of it that has a pulley system that pulls a blade, a set of blades across the top that skim off the pollutants off the top of the water as the air coming up from the bottom is collecting it and coalescing it and collecting it on the top of the water. There is no collection cup. It's this blade that actually scrapes it off the top. Type in dissolved air flotation into YouTube later. You'll understand exactly what I'm talking about. 
The difference is, is that they want micro bubbles because they want it to stay in suspension for a very long time um, and they're in fresh water. So they've got to compress the air and suck it in under very high pressure. And when you get a differential pressure change from high pressure to low pressure, the bubbles micronize into the water. Now, within those two processes, yeah, food waste recycling, exactly, yeah, yeah. So, um, I've got stuff falling off benches here everywhere, sorry guys. Um, <clears throat> so, in the, in, the, in the process of drawing the air in under high pressure, you have a massive chance of nitrogen supersaturation, and when they compress it and then release it, you also have a massive chance and obviously a very high percentage of nitrogen supersaturation. We don't care, they don't care about that in wastewater. Okay? It's not, if it gets put back into a river system, it eventually degasses and equalizes. Hello, David. Nice to see you, man. Um, and if it goes down to the rest of the process, it's just going to get degassed and all sorts of stuff, and it's, it's, it's no longer an issue. You, put, you dissolve nitrogen gas into water with animals in it, with fish in it, that are taking in that, those gases through their gills, you get nitrogen gas bubble disease, you get eyes exploding, you get asphyxiation, all sorts of stuff, it kills them. So we can't use dissolved air flotation in the way it is designed <clears throat> in a freshwater system. In a saltwater system, you don't really need to because the bubbles are small enough already, right? Um, so the dissolved air flotation technology adapts foam fractionation from other industries. And foam fractionation isn't isolated to the aquaculture or aquarium industry. It's, I can't remember where it came. I think it was from wastewater. Dissolved air flotation is kind of the next evolution of it. But it's, yeah, it, it, it's horses for courses. It's different, different, different technology for a different application, obviously. Um, so to answer Max's question, um, you will likely never see it. And if you do steer away from it, because nitrogen supersaturation will kill your fish very quickly. Julian, why are you calling me? Why are you calling me Jules? Um, the next question Julian asked me <clears throat> which is an excellent question which is one of the things that I was going to cover so I'll cover it now. Should skimmers be rated on volume or bioload slash biomass? Okay, <clears throat> so both, okay, and here's why. The more waste you have in a system, the bigger the fractionator might need to be. The more water you have, the more that that waste is spread out and diluted into that water. So primarily, you need to treat it on water volume. Secondly, you need to treat it on turnover rate per hour through the foam fractionator or protein skimmer based on the biomass. And then if your biomass is incredibly high, you may then need to increase the size of the foam fractionator again. So the first is water volume. And I'll get into turnover rates in a minute. So the first is water volume. The second is um, biomass. And uh, what did I say the third one was? Yeah, well, that's that's it. Oh, and the third one is, is, is oh, no, okay, so sorry. The first one is water volume. The second is turnover rate through that fractionator in relation to the water volume. And the third is biomass. And that's the, the three orders that you should that you should work on. So to give you an example, if you had a 100,000 litre system, I'm talking about aquaculture here, right? So if you had a 1,000 litre system, a uh, 100,000 litre system, excuse me, and you had a biomass of, let's say, 
50 kilos per cubic meter. So 50 kilos per cubic meter is over 100 cubic meters is uh, 5,000 kilos. So five ton of fish. 50 kilos per cubic meter of fish, so, so 5,000 5, kilos of fish and 100,000 litres of water, in aquaculture terms, really isn't that high, okay? Um, you can operate that on really standard aeration. You can operate it on, you know, very, very simple filtration. Your foam fractionator doesn't really need to be that large, right? So rules of foam fractionators, Minimum two minute dwell time. If you wanted a higher turnover and you didn't have a higher stocking density and it was lower than that, you might be able to go down to 1.5 minutes, but two minutes is generally where we sit at the two minute dwell time. And I'll get into that in a minute. Um, turnover rate, 100,000 litres of water. Um, you generally want to put through a minimum of 50% of the water volume per hour through the foam fractionator at those sort of stocking densities, yeah? Okay, so, <clears throat> um, so we've talked about water volume, 100,000 litres. We've talked about turnover per hour, which is 50% which is per hour for a 50 kilo per cubic metre stocking density, which, again, isn't that much. You guys are never going to reach that, okay? So your turnover rates can be less, okay? And I'll get into that too. When we're talking about, um, say, we were to increase that to 100 kilos per cubic metre, or we would increase that to 150 kilos per cubic meter, all of a sudden we're talking about a very high amount of BOD. We're talking about a very high amount of food in relation to the same water volume. We're talking about a, uh, the need to inject pure oxygen and, and the need to strip out a lot of fine particles out of the water because they are going to add to the biological oxygen demand, which is going to reduce the amount of oxygen in the water. All of these things go into determining how you need to size a protein skimmer. And there is no set formula for this stuff. There is a set formula for a lot of it, but a lot of it is then experience and intuition as well. Okay, so, which is kind of what we do in the aquaculture industry when we size these things. So if, if someone come to me and they said they had, a, like we've just gone over a 50 kilo per cubic meter stocking density and 100,000 litres of water. Say someone came to me and they said, I want to grow 200 kilos per cubic meter of barramundi and I'm going to be injecting pure oxygen and this is all the stuff I have and... Excuse me for one second. I think I just heard that dog outside. Uh, the only reason I'm concerned is that the dog's actually pregnant with pups and she's about to have them, so I don't want to be in the outside, um, at the front, without, you know, if she's gotten out. Anyway, so if we had a uh, system, you know, someone come to me and said, I've got a 100,000 litre system, all the filtration's already in place. I've got, I'm going 200 kilos per cubic meter of bar, um, so my stocking density is 20 tonnes in 100,000 litres. Um, I'm injecting pure oxygen. I'm having a real problem with solids and, um, and uh, clarity in the water. Um, need to get that out. So, um, I would I would think to myself in that circumstance. Uh, okay, so we've got a shitload of food going in, and at let me just do a quick calculation here. At uh, 20 tonnes, so 20,000 kilos, if we were even feeding them a 1% body weight per day, that is 200 kilos of food a day going into that system. And it's more likely they're being fed at 1.5 to 2% body weight per day. So it could be anywhere between 300 and 400 kilos of food going in there per day. That produces a lot of shit, okay? Some of that's going to be taken out by the drum filter. You get a lot of fines coming through, okay? This is what our protein skimmer is pulling out. It's pulling out predominantly micron sizes of 60 to 50, 50 to 60 microns and below. And the longer the dwell time in your frac, the better that removal is going to be. And then ozone comes into it and all this sorts of stuff. I'm going to go into ozone as well. So 
if we had the same water volume four times the stocking density, I'd go, okay, so we've got the same water volume, 100,000 litres. We've got a stocking density of 200 kilos per cubic metre, four times that of the 50 kilo per cubic metre stocking density. So if the flow rate remains the same, so the flow rate going past the, the protein skimmer, so that remains the same at whatever it is, two times per hour or whatever it might be. But we have that much more waste in the system. <clears throat> um, we need to increase the turnover through the frack so that it's processing more water within the sump per hour to result in the net positive gain for the water coming out of the frack that's being mixed into the water that's going back to the system. The other thing that we then need to consider is is a 100% turnover per hour going to be enough? Or do we want to add an extra safety factor in here? Generally, we stick between 50 to 100% per hour. Okay. Um, perhaps we would put the same flow rate through there and have a bigger frack and have a longer dwell time than two minutes. Maybe that's, maybe that's useful. And then if we want to do, we'd put the pump on a VSD um, and, you know, push less or more water through it if we want to process more water, yeah? Um, ozone as well, um, ozone as well will, will aid in removal, um, will, will, will aid in removal dramatically by, ozone will microflocculate the particles, and no, I'm not swearing at you. What that means is it will grab the small particles and turn them into larger particles so that they coagulate and flocculate and you can pull them out easier. The other thing it will do is it will remove, it will stop um, particles or it will lessen the likelihood of particles being hydrophobic by oxidising them and allow them to be more easily removed. Now, in a protein skimmer, protein skimmers, if, you're, if you have high stocking densities and you're sizing ozone to a feed rate for a clear water system, and this is in an aquaculture system I'm speaking of, um, you're going to have the issue that you're physically not going to be able to get enough ozone into the fractionator to achieve that. And if you put too much ozone into your fractionator, you are you do run the very large risk of breaking up the foam head of the fractionator. So it's very important to stick to residual levels within your fractionator. And if you need ozone levels over and above that, you put it in a dedicated reactor. My recommendations generally are to size in an aquarium application, size it to water volume, which I'm quite happy to assist with, um, but don't really exceed a residual level of 0.25 milligrams per litre of ozone in the protein skimmer at point of contact. And there's a way that you can work that out in relation to gram milligrams per hour flowing into the fractionator versus litres per minute flowing through the fractionator. Essentially, it's pretty simple at the point of contact. Target redox levels, generally speaking, for a healthy aquarium would be anywhere between 250 for fresh water and 350 for salt water. Um, you can go a little bit higher. I know some coral holding facilities are holding them at 400 to 450 um, and potentially increasing it higher than that for pack out, for fish and coral, knowing that it's going to drop. Um, <clears throat> bromate levels really don't kick in, um, and, and high bromous acid and, and uh, residual oxidants um, don't really kick in until about 600 to 700 millivolt mark. So you're not actually going to ever get those. Um, I'm happy to be proved wrong. I'm sure that there is some bromate production um, at, at lower levels, but it's that low, and bromate is obviously an oxidizer as well, that it oxidizes before it ever becomes a problem. So if you have, use, a, use an OIP controller and so help you, if you ever apply ozone and do not apply an OIP controller, I will find you, okay? I will. Never, ever, ever put an ozone generator on a system with livestock without having an OIP controller installed. Make sure you calibrate it and maintain it regularly and make sure that you are exchanging your ORP probe about every 12 months because it is going to be operating 24 hours a day, okay? Never, ever, ever operate an ozone generator without an ORP controller.
I don't care how good, how long you've been running it for, Murphy's Law will eventually bite you in the ass. 420 is reasonably safe. Look, yeah, I'd probably recommend you run it at 350. Some animals will like it lower, some animals will like it higher. Some systems just run higher um, and animals don't seem to mind. Um, yeah. So ozone, you all know ozone is one of my most favorite filtration methods. Um, if it's applied correctly, if it's, if it's you know, controlled correctly, and if it's, you know, utilised in the way it needs to be utilised. No, like, higher levels of ozone, you're not going to put that into a fractionator. So it's, you know, a fractionator is one vector for ozone application, but it's not the only vector, and it should not ever be considered the only vector because it can have negative effects on your fractionator performance if you put too much in. Good as mud? Um, so, I hope that answers uh, the questions on volume versus bioload and biomass. Um, it's both. You need to take all, any. Uh, you need to take all of the above into account. So, if we're talking about aquarium systems, your biomass is incredibly low. I mean, look. I know, you know, one guy that has gut loads of fish, a predator tank or a fish only tank that has, you know, a eight by two by two and he's got 23 tangs in it that are all nearly a foot long and he feeds two blocks of frozen food at night or something like that. I get it, your tank's heavily stocked. But you know what? I probably wouldn't think there'd be any more than maybe five kilos per cubic meter of water if you worked it out. If you took every fish out of that tank and weighed it, and then even if you calculated the amount of food, which is another way that you can potentially size foam fractionators, but it's very, it's iffy, it's, yeah, there's not a lot of work that's been done on it, it's still a work in progress. Look, it's, it's, it's never gonna be what the benchmarks are that we use to apply them in agriculture, and that's where I'm scaling it back from, okay? so. If you have an aquarium system, I would probably say that a 25 to 30% turnover per hour through your fractionator at a two minute dwell time would nail any application that you had, probably even the heaviest stocking application because one, 30% turnover per hour through the fractionator 24 hours a day is massive for an aquarium system. And secondly, if you're applying that at a two minute dwell time, you're going to be head and shoulders above nearly every single protein skimmer built for aquarium systems on the market today. Now, I've written blog posts on, the, I've written a blog post on this, and, um, hey Tim, <laughs> it's the bacteria guy. Um, I've written blog posts on this. I would like to see a standardized system for sizing protein skimmers in the aquarium industry. I would like to see that, um, you know, look, uh, you can't, we're, we're kind of there with the with the aquarium industry. It's just like this is for low stocking, this is for high stocking. But in regards to what, no one's actually saying what their dwell times are. No one's actually saying what their air to water ratio is. Uh, like some people are saying, yeah, I've got this much air going, and blah blah blah. More air isn't better. More air does not. I repeat, does not compensate for a lack in dwell time. There are particles in water the majority of particles in water that need two minutes of dwell time to remove, okay? Only after constant oxidation and flogging through the protein skimmer are these things removed. Now, if you're, people say, oh yeah, my protein skimmer is always producing foam, it's always foaming off its head, that's bad. If your protein skimmer is always ripping out waste and constantly needs to be cleaned. That is not a measure of a well-designed or sized protein skimmer. That is a measure of an undersized and ill-designed protein skimmer. If you can't have a protein skimmer that has dips and lulls in its production of foam, then you know that the protein skimmer is always struggling to keep up because it's always having to pull stuff out. 
if you have a protein schema and there's no way to know whether you're right on the cusp or you're at 50% removal. There's no way of knowing that. Yeah, you can say, oh, I've got low nitrate and low phosphate and blah, blah, blah. That is not the only indicator, okay? Um, growth is an indicator. There's all, there's all sorts of indicators that, that, that you need to look at. I'll get, I'll get to that in a minute, Bruce, actually. Um, oftentimes it's impossible, but I'll get to that in a minute. Um, so, where was I? I've gone off on a tangent, answering Bruce's question, and I've lost my train of thought. Right, yes, production. Um, so, what you want is you want a protein skimmer that phones its guts out when you feed, and then when you look at it three hours later or whatever, it's just sort of just bubbling over the top, but it's not really producing a lot of waste. There's not a lot of waste globules in the foam head. You don't have a lot of waste being produced. Like, you don't... I'm sure you guys understand what I mean. I mean, having a protein skimmer that phones off its guts 24-7 is an undersized protein skimmer. It's an undersized or ill-designed protein skimmer. But I have to admit, sometimes, in an aquaculture system, we have exactly that, because the systems are run harder than they're designed for, in some cases. So we put in a, on a second fractionator, or we pull that out and put in a bigger fractionator, or we apply ozone to aid in the extra removal of those, of those particles within the system. Um, so, um, Christian Hoffman, I don't know if Mr. Hoffman's here. He hasn't dropped a comment yet. Um, dwell times, etc., in relation to commercial versus hobby level skimmers, i.e., recirculating skimmers. So, nearly 100% of the. Hey, Ash, you were driving. I hope home from the bottle O to crack a refreshing beverage. Um, and if so, tell me what you're drinking. This is this is a a um, a tradition. Everyone has to uh, tell us what they're doing. Bruce, you still haven't told me what you're sipping on at the moment. Actually, I'm a little bit disappointed. Um, so, with the exception of a few, all commercial foam fractionators are recirculating fractionators or protein skins, and that means that they have a dedicated venturi pump and they have a dedicated flow pump sized to the flow rate of the fractionator to deliver the, the, the flow rate needed at the design dwell time, which in nearly 100% of the cases is two minutes. Okay. I think we recently sized one at 1.5 minutes dwell time. Um, still in July. <laughs> oh, you poor bugger. Um, we recently sized one at 1.5 minutes because it was a brood stock holding facility and the stocking density was something like 0 0.7 kilos per cubic meter. It physically just didn't have that much load on it. Um, it was a prawn brew stock holding facility. And we were applying some ozone into the fractionator. We had quite a large drum filter on it. The biofilter was substantial. Um, and we had a lot of UV on it as well. We just didn't think a two-minute dwell time was needed. And it allowed us to go sort of to the next size up, um, in, or the next size down, I should say, in fractionator, um, while still maintaining the flow rate through the fractionator that we wanted to target, which I think was about 30 to 40%. Um, which was probably still overkill. But sort of once you get down below that, the net positive gain that you get is sort of on a knife's edge. You're not physically processing enough through the fractionator to see a positive effect in your water. So that's where I'd sort of say 25 to 30% turnover in your fractionator or, or protein skimmer in, in your hobby systems is, is probably a good place to sit. Okay. Um, so two minute dwell time in commercial applications is just because there's physically that much waste. The concentration of waste is that much higher. I can almost guarantee that the dwell times in hobbyist protein skins 
especially those that have an integrated flow and venturi pump and when i'm talking about venturis i'm mostly talking about aspirators so needle wheels right which you would never use in a commercial application because they will just get clogged um if there's needle wheel pumps that don't get clogged over time i would love to hear about them um I've always been a big fan of the bubble blaster pumps from Reef Octopus, but I've never used them in a commercial application. Um, so I can't comment there. Um, having said that, the air to water ratio still needs to be optimal. So we, we still need to consider that. Um, more air does not mean better removal. And, and, and the air displaces water volume within the protein skimmer as well. That's something else that you have to consider because if you have more air than usual within the protein skimmer, obviously you need to take into account the amount of water that, that air displaces so that you can recalculate the size of your reaction chamber so that you're actually still getting a two-minute dwell time. Because if you want 500 litres a minute and you want a two-minute dwell time, you need a thousand litre reaction vessel. But if there's 50 or 70 litres of water that's displaced by air, then you need to compensate for that. Otherwise, you're 50 to 70 litres behind and you're not getting a two minute dwell time anymore. It's, it's, it's a nuanced, it's, yeah, it's, there's a lot of things to consider that honestly, I don't think a lot of manufacturers actually consider when they're building protein skimmers. Um, so I wouldn't imagine that dwell times within hobbyist um, protein skimmers would be in more than 30 seconds, honestly, maybe a minute, maybe. Um, and honestly, that, that needs to, it needs to be standardised. There needs to be a standardised system. There needs to be a standardised system that says what the dwell time is. Um, manufacturers need to do their due diligence and say, um, we have designed this to take into account air displacement of the water. Um, we know the volume of our protein skimmer. We know how much water is dis the air is displacing, so we know how we can calculate dwell time. We then will tell you what the dwell time is, whether it's one minute, whether it's 1.5, whether it's two minutes, you know? And then we will tell you, at these rates, it will suit a heavily stocked tank at a 40% turnover per hour and comfortably do it, because I'm telling you right now, at a two minute dwell time, at a 40% turnover, it will shit in anything that you throw at it. I will guarantee it. I'll bet my left leg on it. And then for lightly stock systems, you can go back. You can, you can, you can go back. And, and there is actual quantitative data to, to support that. And this is kind of like when we, when we, when we size up firm fractionators, when we've tested firm fractionators in the past, when we test air draws on pumps, everything like this, we record all this data. It builds our data points to allow us to better size fractionators or protein skins. So it's it's a it's a massive problem. It, there is no standardisation in the aquarium industry to to say like everyone says, oh yeah, it'll suit a heavily stock system of four hundred liters. In regards to what? Like you're not giving me any information here. How am I supposed to trust what you're telling me? Yeah. Oh, this this skimmer suits a four hundred liter system, and 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 B skimmer suits a four hundred liter system. A heavily stocked system but this one's six inches shorter and it's an inch smaller in diameter so it must have a better pump but you're not telling me what the dwell time is you're not telling me what the turnover of the system volume is you're not telling me that you've done due diligence in working out what your air displacement is. none of this stuff is being done and i can guarantee it hasn't been done because i've tested the foam fractionators and i've tested flow rates through them in regards to you know to get a two minute dwell time in regards to air displacement with hobbyist skimmers and I'm not going to name the brands and it's piss dribbling out and it's not hard to design a, 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 a skimmer to do this it's really not you've just got to have the data and the know-how and the experience to do it this is this is why you guys need to be aware of this because I mean people will say Oh yeah, you know, we've got this skimmer and we have an inch smaller in diameter, but we're pumping 50% more air into it. How much of that air is actually being used to hit? I mean, a, a column full of bubbles and a high suction flow rate of, um, of air does not mean better skimming. 
In fact, it means the opposite. When you have a lot of air inside a very small volume, have you ever sat there and watched your foam head and seen those large bubbles sort of slug up through the foam head? And I can guarantee most of you have, and I can guarantee most of you are probably going to go and look at your fractionators and you'll find it. And if you don't, well done, you've probably got a variable speed drive on it and you probably back that off. And I mean, you know, if you haven't got a recirculating skimmer, all luck to you because like you, you have no control over your flow rate going into your skimmer. You're completely at the mercy of the suction rate of the skimmer. But when you get those slug flows, that's, that's smaller air bubbles coalescing into larger air bubbles. And when that happens, that means that you've got too much air in the, in, in the chamber. And then obviously it has a, it, it rises at a larger velocity, it breaks up your foam head and completely fucks your skimming efficiency. So more air does not mean better frack. It, it doesn't, it, it can't. The, the, the level of air, um, the level of air inside a frack is theorized and has been tested at being about 13% of the overall volume, depending on whether or not the pump is sized correctly. And Reese, so a small pump on a big protein skimmer body will work if the maths is done? Yes. If the correct amount of air put in to the skimmer body is calculated and that pump is matched on a Venturi to produce that amount of air. Now, I'm not saying needle wheels are bad. In an aquarium application, they're quite fine. The maintenance is higher on them and the loads are lower so they don't get clogged. You put that in a commercial application and it will turn into a solid ball of snot in two weeks. It's a huge amount of air, a huge amount of oxygen going in there, a, very, a lot of very small spaces. Um, it's a nightmare. Um, RK2 have tried it and they've just said, no, nah, it's not worth it. We'll put Venturis on and we continue to do so. And they've, they've come up with ways of optimizing their, their airflow now um, with Venturis. Um, honestly, I think a better Venturi can be built for more airflow, less blocking, you know, the technology just hasn't been invented yet. But, you know, commercial, but, <laughs> Sort of like concentration versus toxicity we're talking about here. We're talking about um, efficiency versus operation. You would never put a needle wheel into a commercial application because it will clog and your efficiency will drop. Sacrifice a little bit less efficiency for a little bit better operation in a, in a normal venturi injector. That's kind of where we're looking at it now. <clears throat> so, yeah, if a system needs to be standardized for protein skimmers in the aquarium industry. And if anyone would like to kickstart that, I'd definitely love to be involved. In fact, I might even do it myself. Might even put a blog post out about it. Let's see, we'll see how, <laughs> we'll see how active I get. Um, okay, uh, Ashley Thompson has asked, types of skimmers, Venturi, Downdraft, Beckett, etc. internal versus external, pros and cons, dwell time, wet skin versus dry skin, or two skimmers versus one large skimmer. Okay, so um, types of skimmers, really the only types, the, the, the types that differentiate themselves between the two are countercurrent and co-current. Um, co-current skimmers are by far very much less efficient than countercurrent. By co-current, I mean both the air and the water is introduced at the bottom, either separately or together, via one pump or, or separately via two pumps. Co-current means that the water comes in the top and the air comes in the bottom, so the water's coming down to meet the air coming up and they clash. You get better mixing, you get better contact. <clears throat> you don't, you have no, you have uh, no chance of short circuiting by the air going in and then going straight out the outlet. And I mean, you know, the d internal design of skimmers kind of prevents that. But at the end of the day, if you've got it coming in the top and the air coming in the bottom, not only are you getting better contact, but you're also, you know, minimising the amount of short circuiting almost completely. Um, <clears throat> so they're, they're, they're the first two differentiations between protein skimmers. The second differentiation is the type of protein skimmer, and that's pretty much got to do with the injector. So that's um, the venturi, whether it's an aspirating venturi on suction on a needle wheel, or whether it's a pressurised venturi by pumping it through something like a massive injector. Um, downdraft, not very widely used. They're like a column filled with bioballs or twisted up stuff um, that creates turbulence and creates bubbles. 
very hard to regulate the amount of bubbles done. It's kind of a guessing game. I'm sure there's some maths out there behind it, but at the end of the day, I think the majority of it is anecdotal and trial based. Um, Beckett, Beckett. Beckett nozzle, it's pretty much like a Venturi nozzle. Again, there's no way, well, there is a way to regulate the air, and that's because they put valves on them, but essentially it's a pond injector um, that, that someone said, hey, that would make a great pronoun skimmer injector, and they put that there. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter what injector you put on it, you need to size it for the amount of air going in, so there's not too much air, but not too little air, and then you need to size it in regards to the dwell time. doesn't matter what injector you put on it. And then it comes down to efficiency versus operation as well. So... How efficient is it going to be versus how long is it going to maintain that efficiency in operation? A needle wheel on a commercial application, as we've gone over, <laughs> not going to work. Beckett's, I'd probably argue the same. Downdraft, I would definitely say, would be clogged. Worse than me and hay fever season. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> internal versus external. Um, internal skimmers are only internal skimmers because they require to be submerged because they're using the suction pump for the water flow and the airflow. Um, external skimmers can be used externally or internally because they have a separate venturi pump and a separate supply pump as long as both those pumps are actually submersible. If they're not submersible, then, they're, then they are restricted to be external, but they still have the advantage of um, being able to regulate the amount of flow going in and out of the unit by having a separate pump to supply them. Um, Reef Octopus, for example, one of the only ones that I know of that do an external recirculating skimmer, and um, hats off to Reef Octopus for doing that right from the start. Um, yeah. But, having said that, there's no standardised sizing on it. Again. Um, yeah, we go back to that subject. Um, two small skimmers versus one large skimmer. The only advantage that two small skimmers would have versus one large skimmer if you're sizing into the same turnover rate and the same water volume is that you would have redundancy if one failed. Um, having said that, if you were to buy one large skimmer, um, I would dare say that it would probably be cheaper than buying two small skimmers and then a spare pump. So, potato, potato. Um, <clears throat> okay, so Matt, <laughs> coastal clownfish, Matt Bates. Um, I love Reef October as well. We're not quite there. We're a few days out. Reef October is awesome. Optimal, if there is any. Flow rate on external skimmers. Um, okay, so flow rate, uh, optimal flow rate on internal or external skimmers. Um, that all depends on the size of the skimmer, obviously, and that depends on the dwell time. Optimal dwell time is two minutes. And because no, uh, no aquarium protein skimmer states their dwell time and the flow rate in relation to that, and what the turnover rate per hour is through that protein skimmer in relation to the biomass and the water volume, there is no way of knowing apart from testing that yourself with the bucket on the outlet. And then calculating the amount of volume, and because you've got all these hourglass and cone shaped skimmers, you'd probably be better off to get a, a graduated one lead jug and pour water into it and physically measure it. And then measure how much the air displaces when you turn on the venturi pump. There's a lot of different tests that you have to do to work this out. This is sort of how we, 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 you know, dimension protein skimmers when we're designing them, yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's two minute dwell time is optimum. And that will then relay back to the flow rate that you put through that fractionator. Um, any such thing as foaming agents for skimmers? If you feed, it'll foam up. <laughs> um, there are um, foaming agents for skimmers that you can get. Um, to give you an idea, too much organic carbon in the system from bio pellets will definitely make your skimmer foam like a bastard. Um, we, had a, 
We had an interesting uh, incident um, at the retail store that I used to work at where we were using bio pellets very effectively in our display tank. Um, but the protein skimmer was just foaming. There was micro bubbles all through the tank. It was ridiculous. Um, and we worked out everything. We cleaned all the foam fractionator out and everything like that. And in the end, I, I just went, oh, God, look, I'm just going to rip everything down in the, in, the, in the sump and try and find what the problem is. And I pulled the bi-pellet reactor apart, and these bi-pellets had only been there f in there for maybe a month, and all of the bi-pellets were like pitted and eaten away like, um, like a bit of scoria. They were all like, they weren't pellets anymore. They, it's like little people had come along and taken bites out of old sides of them. So I, they were just like golf ball dimples, but really big, like gouges out of them, right? And I'm thinking, what's going on here? Anyway, I go back and I go back and I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about it and I'm racking my brain and I'm talking to the boys. Um, I'm talking to the boys, uh, you know, when we're, when we're dosing up and stuff. And I'm just like, I just don't get it. Like these biopellets, it's like something's eating them away. Like they've gone in overdrive or something. And they're just like, oh, okay. Well, I don't know how that's happened. I said, you guys are following this dosing regime, aren't you? Like from what we worked out, like we were dosing some Zevit stuff. Um, and they're just like, oh yeah, yeah. And then uh, the tank was looking a bit cloudy. So we started, um, we started double dosing Zeozyme morning and night. I'm just like, huh? Yeah, it's just we thought more would be better. Zeozyme is an enzyme. Enzymes are made to break down organic carbon and organic waste to liberate the waste so that it can be removed by bacteria. So they're double dosing the zeozyme and then they're double dosing it and then they're dosing it morning and night. So they're quadruple dosing it. So the the amount of enzymes in the system are going in overdrive and they're eating away the biopellets. And what happens when you get an excess of organic carbon in the water? Well, you uh, you lower the surface tension on the outside of the bubbles and they stay in suspension for longer. So they come up and out of the protein skimmer and the protein skimmer phones like buggery and then you get micro bubbles all through your tank. We did a huge water change, we stopped dosing zeozyme, we replaced the bio pellets, problem stopped, never came back. Like it was An excess of organic carbon made it dose. And, and this, this is, you know, when you when you feed, when you put in amino acids, when you put in, you know, um, like uh, omega fatty acids, when you coat your food, these are all things that help. I mean, if your protein skimmer is not foaming, it, there's either no load in the door, there's something wrong with the protein skimmer. It's not a lack of the ability for it to foam. If there's micro bubbles in there, it's going to foam. If there's waste there, you know. Buying an off-the-shelf preparation to make it foam is not actually addressing the issue that you're having. Um, benefits on maintaining skimmers, uh, pumps, one, um, should be maintained once a month without fail. Venturi injectors should be maintained once a month without fail. Um, and that can be as simple as tipping some fresh water down the suction of the down the suction of the Venturi injector to get rid of all the, um, the salt creep build up and crap like that. Um, cleaning the neck should be done, if you can, daily to every second day. Any build up of crud inside the neck, um, a you know moderate build up of crud inside the neck can reduce your skimming efficiency by 40 to 50% or more. And this is why automatic neck cleaners are so beneficial. This is why all of our commercial units come with automatic washdowns that wash down the inside and also the outside of the cup. Um, the inside is the most important though. If you can keep the inside of that cup clean, you will increase your skimming efficiency by a minimum of 40%. Um, yeah, so that's, that's pretty much that. Um, keep your skimmers clean. And obviously, you know, if you have coralline build up on the inside of your skimmer, you have crab build up on the inside of your skimmer, um, you know, once every couple of months, take it out and just give it a good rogering, you know, give it a clean, take care of your stuff. 
Like, yeah, oh, I paid eight hundred, nine hundred dollars for my protein skimmer. I shouldn't have to touch it. No, you pay eight hundred to nine hundred dollars for your protein skimmer. That is more of an excuse to touch it because you've paid eight to nine hundred dollars for your protein skimmer. Why would you sit it there and let it go to rack and ruin? Because you think that the more something costs, the less you have to maintain it. If you if you buy a $1,000 car, you're still going to go and get a service one. It needs to get serviced, just the same as if you buy a $100,000 bloody kitted out sports edition D-Max. You're still going to take it and get it serviced regularly, no matter how much it costs, because it's got to run, and it's got to run effectively. Like, maintain your skimmers, or I will find you. <laughs> Are there any domestic self-cleaning skimmer options out there? Yeah, a lot of the Dell Tech and Reef Octopus stuff have self-cleaning necks on them, or they have self-cleaning necks available. Um, there's other options out there. There's a heap of DIY stuff. You can do it with like spray down systems, irrigation systems, and stuff like that. So yeah, there's a lot out there. Um, what I reckon, should you run the skimmer before or after the refugium? Oh god, this is this is about as controversial as the subject itself, Jules. Um, okay, so the idea of the refugium is to remove waste, but also um, to add life back to the system for it to go back to the system itself. Arguably, it is a form of biological filtration, considering that is removing nitrate and phosphate, as well as obviously those plants will remove a portion of ammonia and nitrite. Now we all know that biological filtration works better with lower levels of particles and solid mass and BOD, or biological oxygen demand in the system. So by pure logic, I would say apply it before, because you're gonna clean up that water, reduce the load on the refugium, and allow the refugium to concentrate on the, um, on the uh, substrate concentrations of uh, nitrate and phosphate that it needs to rather than have to worry about getting clogged up and stuff like that. Obviously, if it, you know, it gets silted up, you've got to clean it out. If it gets silted up, not a lot of light's going to get to your refugium. Uh, if you've got an algae reactor, it's going to block up. Um, before, 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 before. So essentially, you should go mechanical filtration, primary biological filtration, protein skimming, and then any other chemical filtration that you have, and you can add ozone in there, and obviously you, you guys know my needs of ozone. So, um, bear with me one sec, my glass is really warm, I've got to get a new cold glass, just see if I... I think this one should last a little bit longer between refills. So, um, right, so we've talked about um, a lot of different subjects at this point in time in relation to protein skimmers. Um, we've talked about standardising the sizing. I think that's something that really needs to happen. Um, something I've been banging on with for a, with a while with a few different people, but it's good to you know actually get the thought out there. Um, the other thing is, guys, uh, coming back to applying a single skimmer versus multiple skimmers. Uh, just hold on for a sec, guys. Just my son coming to say goodnight, guys. Sorry about that. Um, <clears throat> so um, the other thing is, is in a commercial um, sort of setting, um, when we're talking about uh, multiple skimmers, um, the system may physically be too large to um, apply skimmers into it. Um, well, one skimmer into it, you may have to apply some, uh, a couple. An example in your you guys situation with aquariums is you might physically not have the headroom to put in the size skimmer that you need to to actually achieve the result that you need to achieve. So you might have to put in multiple small skimmers. So it might be a, a headspace or a height restriction that you guys have. 
there's a very famous picture of I think the Orlando Aquarium or the Miami Aquarium somewhere um, of I think it was 48 RK 2000s, the biggest RK2 foam fractionator model that they built, which is suited for I think a flow rate of 2,800 liters a minute, which is something ridiculous, like nearly 300,000 liters an hour or something crazy like that. Um, lined up, and obviously some of them were doing different exhibits, but a lot of them were, were doing multiple uh, multiple foam fractionators for one exhibit. Sometimes there might just not be a protein skimmer big enough. Sometimes it might be cheaper for you to go with multiple smaller units rather than one larger one. Because like, without, without standardizing the sizing, it's hard to see what is sized where, you know, whether or not they just throw on that pump on that skimmer because that's what they've done with that model and it should work okay. And when they plug it in, it works fine, you know. A smaller, model of one brand of skimmer might work better if you apply two of them than a larger model of another brand of skimmer that you're considering because there's no standardization to the sizing of these things. So pace of your homework. Um, okay, Julian has just asked, thanks for answering that. Ever thought that the life multipods that live in the refugium bed from the solid and particular matter that directly drop from the tank? Um, definitely, that's what they're eating off. Um, now, uh, you're never going to get 100% removal of particles. And I think you probably agree that no matter how good your protein skimmer is, you're still going to get a build up of mold over time. Um, the other thing to consider here, guys, is if you have a higher flow rate, water volume aside, the water volume is always going to stay the same. If you have a turnover rate of twice per hour, through your sump, which honestly in an aquaculture system is more than enough to maintain water quality if the rest of your filtration is sized accurately. In an aquarium system, it could be as low as one time per hour turnover because all you're doing is maintaining water quality. The rest of the water flow is happening with wave makers in your tank, right? So flow over the coals is different to flow past your filtration. So you have a flow of once per hour past your skimmer and you have a 30% turnover of your water volume per hour through that skimmer, you are processing 30% of a once per hour turnover that goes past that skimmer, right? You increase that to two times per hour, the water is flowing past that skimmer twice as fast. And so if the skimmer is still operating at the same flow rate, it's arguably processing less waste because the flow is flowing past it faster so that the water suction from the pump can't pick up that waste as effectively. You increase that to five times per hour turn. Do you see what I'm getting at? So again, more turnover through your filtration sump, I'm saying, isn't necessarily better. Through the filtration components, that's different. But through the filtration itself, through the sump, not necessarily better. Um, so, air to water. So, look, again, okay, so there's a couple of companies out there that produce commercial skimmers that started off in the aquarium trade, okay? Um, and some of them do it right. Some of them say, I've got this dwell time, I've got that dwell time. Um, I'll get you to explain that comment, Triton. I'm not sure where you're going with that, Jules. Um, but some of them say, we put more air into our protein skimmers, so our protein skimmers can handle more flow and a less dwell time. As I've said, some particles simply need two minutes to get to, to latch on. They need a larger water volume. They need less turbulence within the foam fractionator body to physically get removed. Now, 
um, that has a lot to do. And it's not just it's not just height. It's not just flow through there. It's the diameter. It's how the water and air mixture is introduced. It's how it flows up through. It's how it's distributed through the reaction chamber. It's where the water comes in. It's how the dynamic flow of the water actually comes in and then mixes through the protein fractionator. It's the transition of the water from the main body into the cone and then into the cup and how smooth that transition is. Um, how often the cup is cleaned. All these kind of things. Trite recommends 10 times volume of the display tank through the sump per hour. Is that to aid in the turnover of the system? Or is that for any other particular circumstance? Because speaking from a logical system design point of view, you only need to pass the water through the filtration as often as is needed to maintain water quality to sustain that life effectively. If you flow it through there too fast, you reduce the dwell time through your biological filtration, through your refugium, and the amount that your protein skimmer and other, um, other filtration devices can actually pick up, which reduces their effectiveness. Um, for instance, uh, removal rates in biological filtration versus dwell time um, directly impacts the amount of ammonia and nitrate it can remove. Now, obviously speaking, you guys have a much lower dwell time, so uh, much lower bio load, so the dwell time in the biological filtration probably isn't as crucial. Um, but, you know, when you're speaking in terms of the foam fractionator and especially the UV steriliser, if you have more water going back to the display tank in the UV steriliser and you're putting the UV on the return, the UV needs to be 10 times bigger than if it's, you know, applied on the once per hour turnover. You could apply it on a loop, obviously, but, you know, there's, we've been over that in past streams. Um, the pump should be ready to this. Actually, the real turnover would be lower. But, it, but what is the reason to that, Jules? And I'm not saying it's wrong, I'm just saying what the reason is so I can understand what the theory behind actually sizing it to that is. Is it to aid in the turnover of the aquarium or is it in relation to the water flow past the filtration devices? Assuming, of course, that every filtration system is going to be different, or is this in particularly in relation to the Triton method of filtration, although I'm not particularly up on what that is. Feeding the refugium. Okay, right, so that's the flow of nitrate and phosphate past the refugium, so the refugium doesn't starve. Okay, I can get on that train. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, having said that, it's um, it's the, the, the concentration of nitrate and phosphate is never going to change. So it's just a production per day. So if you have a production of nitrate, um, if you have a production of nitrate and phosphate of 10 parts per million each, if you're flowing it past the refugium 10 times per hour, passing it through there once per hour, over the period of the day, the refugium is still going to get the same amount of food. Perhaps it has something to do with keeping it clean. Perhaps it has something to do with uh, microparticles as well. Having said that, the concentration of those microparticles is going to be the same because the water volume is not changing. I'm just speaking from a logical point of view here, from a system engineer design point of view. Uh, there might be other nuanced, different things that um, feeding the animals in the refugium not the algae. Particles, okay, right. Uh, yeah, okay, I can, I can see that. I can get on board with that. Um, bearing in mind that what we've spoken about is obviously that um, the protein schema will potentially have a uh, reduced effectiveness. Because the amount of water flow past it is higher, and therefore, you know, you're picking up um, a lot of, uh, you're not picking up as much. Now, um, I have designed filtration for quite a few coral holding systems in the recent past. And we've sized those to 1.5 to two times per hour turnover through the filtration. Very heavily stocked propagation systems and they are doing 
exceeding well. We've replicated that now one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, I think eight or nine times. Um, yeah, they're working exceedingly well. So um, it just goes to show that if everything within the system is designed correctly, then you can have an effective system regardless of the turnover through the sump, as long as the individual filtration components are not only engineered and designed properly, but also then applied properly. Now, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about ozone and what it does in the phone fractionator. So, there's a couple of ways that we size ozone for the aquatic system. The first, speaking solely in regards to sizing the protein skimmer, is for the operation of the protein skimmer. Um, ozone microflocculates particles. It oxidizes particles so they're easier to remove. So you've often, you've you've likely heard of hydrophobic particles, particles that want to stay in the water. It oxidizes them so they have less of a hydrophobic charge or no hydrophobic charge so they can be removed. It also stabilizes the foam head and um, and helps to this is this is theorized and from observation seem to actually regulate the size of the bubbles and stabilize the, the foam head within the fractionator so that you get better removal. Now, anyone that has applied ozone to a fractionator that didn't previously have ozone on it will immediately tell you the difference that it had almost overnight to the production of, um, to the production of waste. The clarity of the water as well. So ozone is not only going to uh, help to remove particles, it is also going to remove colorants within the water, like tannins and so forth. That will result in better light penetration within the water. Um, again, you don't want to exceed a concentration of, I think, 0 0.25 milligrams per litre. Don't quote me on that. It's been a while since I've looked at it. It is in my design spreadsheet. I just don't have that on me at the moment. Um, anyone that wants to find out can give me a call or send me an email. Uh, send me an email at the moment, actually, I'm not available generally during the day. Um, uh, anyone that has questions can always message me. Um, the second application, obviously... Um, oh yeah, of course, Shannon, I know it doesn't use all the NO3 and PF401 cycle, hence my comment that it's over a 24-hour period and it's the amount of nutrient that flows past it as well as the particles that feed the animals as well. Um, the determining factor is obviously how much you feed and how often you feed and how often those particles and nutrients are flowing past that refugium per day in relation to the dwell time within the refugium. So yes, 100% agree. Um, so the second application of ozone is obviously to create a clear water system where you have a lot higher level of food going in. Um, so generally speaking, in lower applications, we size it to the water volume and there are certain application rates that we have to size it to the water volume that are very, very accurate and have proven themselves over time. Um, <clears throat> are you stacking a big plastic box on your car? Oh, no, 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 no. That's that box is what uh, that uh, box there is what I clean all my home brew bottles and home brew gear in, um, and that big drum is uh, just for my um, compost tea brewing for the garden. It's got a you can't see it. It's got a, like a tap in the bottom, and I aerate it and make my own fertilizer and stuff. It doesn't it just lives there when I'm using it. Uh, you can see a fermenter in the background over there, um, keg up there, uh, various spray bottles with different things in them there. Yeah, <clears throat> it's a brewery. <laughs> a brewery and a, and a horticulture shed. Um, so uh, generally speaking, the application rates that we have for um, for aquariums, because of the low stocking density, can be sized on the uh, water volumes and they're generally very accurate. 
When we start to get into higher feeding rates, we size the ozone per kilo of food. There are application rates that say anywhere between 15 to 30 grams um, per kilo of food per day is required to create a quote unquote clear water system. A clear water system um, in higher feed rates is just like a clear water system in an aquarium when you're applying ozone, um, essentially achieving the same thing of a millivolt rating of 250 to 350 millivolts, depending on whether you're in freshwater or saltwater. Obviously, freshwater being the lower end, saltwater being the higher end, and it's all going to depend on your species. However, um, a clear water system uh, indicates nice clear water, fantastic, you can see all the fish, that's great. What does that do for an aquaculture system? I don't care if I see my fish, I just want them to grow. Well, you reduce the amount of BOD in the system, you reduce the amount of organics in the system, they're going to add to BOD and COD, being chemical oxygen demand. You're going to reduce the load on your mechanical filtration, so the microflocculation of particles means that your uh, mechanical filtration will physically collect more, and that's not only your protein skimmer. That's your filter socks, that's your filter mats, that's everything else. Uh, hydrogen peroxide will do the same thing. It's an oxidizer. Um, obviously, you know, it's not controllable like ozone is. So ozone is by far the safer to use and you can produce it on site. You only ever have to buy it once instead of having to take hydrogen peroxide all the time and dose it, you know, a one-off dose per day instead of it being dosed 24 hours a day or as it needs to. Um, be does no worries bruce i'll talk to you soon mate um have a good night <clears throat> as always a pleasure um so it makes your mechanical filtration last longer so it's not going to clog up as quickly it then increases the uh, performance of your fractionator the application of ozone can actually increase your carrying capacity and the efficiency of your biological filtration by anywhere from 200 to 500%. It's insane. Um, it can lower the residual amounts of ammonia and nitrite, and, the, and it can then further increase the amount of food that you can feed to the system. Why is that? It is because it is helping to remove the waste before it gets a chance to break down. It is because it will directly oxidize nitrite into nitrate rather than bacteria have to do it. And what happens when you oxidize nitrite into nitrate instead of bacteria having to do it? More surface area is available to ammonia oxidizing bacteria. The problem is, is if you're going too heavy with the ozone, is that you create a single species biofilter. Hence why it needs to be controlled why it needs to be applied in the correct way, why it needs to be applied in the correct point within the system so that it doesn't produce a single species biofilter. The other thing, if you're relying on ozone to produce a single species biofilter to push the bounds, yeah, great, do it. You know, Just be aware that if your ozone breaks down that you're probably going to get a nitrite spike. Okay. Um, you will get a lower increase in efficiency, but still an increase in efficiency by reducing the biological oxygen demand of the system, which means your oxygen levels will go up, your particulate matter will come down, which means that your oxygen levels within the biofilter and the biofilter bacterial levels and thicknesses will be healthier and not as clogged so that they can physically process more ammonia and nitrite. So you might not get as abrupt increase in efficiency as creating a single species biofilter which is fraught with danger if you're not careful about what you're doing however if you didn't impact the species concentration and population and diversity of your biofilter and simply just worked on the efficiencies that you get by creating cleaner water you can still get a very marked increase in efficiency by maybe 150 to 200 percent which is astronomical. You're talking about an aquaculture system going from 1,000 kilos to 1,500 kilos. You've, already, you've just increased your capacity by a third. If you double that, you've doubled your capacity. You know, Or if you're growing coral, you've now reduced your potential nutrient concentrations by 50 to 100%. You know, <laughs> like, Bearing in mind that if you oxidise these particles, that they may be easier to eat for your coral. The amount of light penetration into the water will be higher, which means you can run your lights potentially lower, or your photosynthesis levels will be higher, so your corals will grow faster. 
there's going to be less particles in the water, which means the immune response of your corals and your fish is going to be higher. There won't be as much waste in the water that will physically allow disease causing pathogens and bacteria to proliferate to a point where they're going to become a problem. It's all stitches in the chain that make a, a much more efficient system for creating an environment conducive to growth and health. Does anyone have any questions at all? I'll, I'll tell you right now, my choice of protein skimmer will always be a recirculating protein skimmer because I can control the dwell time. And I can control the amount of air going, being injected into it. So I can make sure it's sized correctly. So if I had an aquarium and I wasn't going to build a fraction of it myself, um, I would research the amount of recirculating fractionators out there. I would then look at the dimensions of those recirculating fractionators and try to estimate from the manufacturer details what the approximate volume would be. Um, if they were a cone or hourglass shape, obviously there's not a lot of ways that you could determine the volume of that to determine what the dwell time would be. Rather there, uh, apart from either seeing one in person, taking measurements and all filling it up with a graduated jug, or emailing the manufacturer and asking what is the volumetric measure of your protein skimmer, which if they can't tell you um, and they're not willing to find out for you, I would, me personally, that would turn me off, you know. Buy it and find out, no. <laughs> um, told you I was gonna rough the feathers, like, but you know, it's, it's not, there's no standardized procedure to actually sizing this up. So, you know, it's, if you wanted to, you know, apply a skimmer in the correct way, you need the, the data and the information in order to do that. Um, and then if at all possible, I would then choose a protein skimmer if it's working on an aspirating needle wheel, which is all the trend these days, which I can see, um, which I can see, you know, the, the benefit in the low stocking application. I would choose a variable speed pump so that I could regulate the amount of air going in, and then I would, it, taking all that into account, I would choose a protein skimmer that allowed me twenty to fifty percent, twenty maybe twenty to thirty percent of the size above the two minute dwell time for the turnover of the system that I was putting in, um, so that I could work out what my air displacement was so that I could regulate that. Pretty easy. Um, simple when, you, when you've got all the data, obviously. Um, Zoe asks, what other types of products can be used alongside a protein skimmer, i.e. there's CO2 scrubbers, ozone, is there much else? Um, yeah, look, CO2 scrubbers um, in an indoor closed system are very useful in an aquarium system um, because of the prevalence of the use of air conditioning or in the winter closing the house up and running the fire. Um, in a system that is well vented, if you had, uh, if you had gas, good gas exchange, you would avoid that. So you may not need a CO2 scrubber, but at the end of the day, it's going to depend on the system and you'll be able to tell that by depressed pH. Um, naturally, your water should sit between 8.2 and 8.4. And, you know, funnily enough, um, systems with a pH predominantly above 8.4 over a 24 hour period will actually kill biopsies. Um, 8.5 to 8.6 consistently will smash biopsies. Um, it'll, it'll just annihilate it. 
um, and it's because it's fighting against the internal pH. And that goes for a lot of uh, the internal pH of the bryopsis and, and it essentially, you know, further synthesizes itself to death. Um, that goes for a lot of nuisance algae as well. Uh, high pH will, will help, and that's, that's you know, a CO2 scrubber will help you do that. Um, in relation to operating a protein skimmer, directly operating a protein skimmer, um, ozone's really the only other thing. Um, there's a lot of upgrades that you could do to a protein skimmer, which would be, you know, an automatic solenoid wash down of the protein skimmer, so that it's actually sucking in some fresh water from the automatic wash down to clean it out. RK2 actually do that now. They have a solenoid on the timer that actually, you know, squirts water into the, into the venturi that keeps it nice and clean, um, stops the salt creep buildup and, and so forth. Um, the only other upgrade that I would say, if you don't have an automatic wash down, make sure there's an auto, uh, install an automatic wash down on this camera. It is quite possibly the number one most beneficial upgrade that you could do to a protein skimmer over and above, you know, manipulating the dwell timing and stuff like that. <clears throat> um, yeah, that's that's about it. I mean, if you, if you had if you had lower oxygen levels and you were applying ozone, you could apply an oxygen concentrator to it, but I'm talking about semi-commercial systems of 10,000 litres or more. I'm not talking about, you know, small systems. There's physically no oxygen concentrator that will, that is small enough or affordable enough to uh, to actually run on a, on a hobbyist size system. Um, obviously, we talked about monitoring, but if you were running ozone, you would definitely run an OIP monitor. Most definitely, without question. On a, um, if you're running ozone, on a, on a protein skimmer, definitely. Um, look, the other thing is, is, is you can apply things into a protein skimmer if you're trying to drop, say, phosphate really quick. You could dose lanthanum chloride slowly into the protein skimmer. I probably wouldn't run ozone at the same time that I was running lanthanum chloride. Um, I have kind of a lanthanum, if it's applied slowly and carefully into a correctly sized protein skimmer, it can be safe and it has been used in the Oceanarium game for quite some time. I only have anecdotal feedback from people that are much better chemists than I am saying that lanthanum is actually very chemically similar to calcium and if it's in high enough concentrations in the water the corals can actually mistake it for calcium and take it up and it can um, it can you know actually kill your corals and become toxic but if it's applied in the correct way, as I said, you know, concentration versus toxicity, that's sort of what we're looking at. So, um, Shane, what is the best way to increase pH? The best way to increase pH is to lower CO2 um, if everything else is in line. So if you have your alkalinity or carbon hardness at correct levels uh, and you have a depressed pH, it is most definitely an elevated level of CO2. To give you an idea, um, we always had depressed pH levels in the retail store that I worked in, and um, when we installed a large um, exhaust system to take the moisture out, because we were having to problems with mould and stuff like that, um, the pH immediately increased within probably two to three hours by. Um, 0.3 of the pH point, so it went from like 7.9 to 8.2 or something like that, and it stayed there. CO2 moves into water about 10 times easier than oxygen does. So if you have an elevated level of CO2 in your system, not only is it heavier, so it settles on top of water, 
um, but it is more soluble. So if you have a protein skimmer sucking in air that's got more CO2 in it, it is going to lower the pH. Um, higher oxygen has absolutely no impact on reducing CO2. So uh, you can have really high oxygen levels and still have a high CO2 level and a low pH. So you need to get rid of that CO2. Now, ways of getting rid of CO2 is to vent the cabinet, is to vent the area that the filtration is in, and make sure it has a um, make sure it has a, uh, a a vector to get out. Um, <clears throat> trickle filters will do it. So breaking the surface tension of the water will get rid of the CO2 as long as you then vent that out to the atmosphere. Um, removing CO2, you can get CO2 scrubbers that you can put on the intake of your skinner that will help. Um, but honestly, the best way is to vent the cabinet to the outside. So either suck out the air or push fresh air in from the outside that doesn't have any, an elevated level of CO2. And if you have tanks that have a lower CO2 level, and this directly relates to a protein skimmer because a protein skimmer is a huge surface area to volume ratio of air into water, so any CO2 that is drawing in is going to get dissolved into the water. I, can, I, I will guarantee that if you have a low pH system and you have a, so if you, say you have an alkalinity of 150 parts per million, right, and you have a, a pH level of 7.8, say, or lower even, I've seen marine systems with pH levels of 7.3 and alkalinity levels of 200 parts per million, or, or you know, above 10, 10 to 12 dkH. So, um, you know, you can, if you were to take the suction of your um, skimmer and put it outside, like out the window, and monitor your pH, I will almost guarantee that within an hour your pH will increase. So it's increasing the flow of fresh air, fresh low CO2 air through the cabinet where you're drawing in CO2 um, and also lowering the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere around it by increasing the airflow. Now, if you're unable to do both of those things, a CO2 scrubber on the inlet of your fractionator is the way to go, but obviously then you need to pay for a consumable. Um, how can you check CO2? You can check CO2 via a test kit or there are PHKH CO2 tables available online that will give you an idea. So it will have um, a pH on an x-axis and a CO2 on the y-axis and you match both of those values up for your tank and it will show you an indicative CO2 level of what you have in the, in the system. And if you have a, you know, any more than three to five parts per million of CO2 in the system, you are going to see a depressed pH and it then goes up exponentially in, in severity as you increase both of those values. Um, breaking, surface, breaking the surface tension in the sump is all well and good, but if you're not then exchanging the air within that area, within the filtration area, with fresh air, all you're going to be doing is re-dissolving CO2. So that's, yeah, about it. And a, a pH skimmer, uh, oh God, a pH skimmer. A protein skimmer is an absolute stinker for being a very good vector for dissolving CO2 into water because it's very small bubbles. And it's drawing in those bubbles and it's putting it into a column of water. And because CO2 moves into water 10 times more efficiently than oxygen does, it'll do it by simple diffusion out of the atmosphere. That's how, that's, that's how soluble it is. You ever walked into a room and started to get a headache, like when it's closed up? Like for any of you that <clears throat> work in a, in a, in a you know, culture facility or work in an aquarium store in the middle of winter, you've got the air con going, everything shut up. Um, you walk in and you know, a couple of hours after you start to get lethargic, you start to yawn, you start to get a headache. That's all elevated CO2 levels. If you hadn't got a CO2 analyzer, and walked into that room and you consistently get headaches or you're lethargic or you're yawning all the time, um, I will almost guarantee that you can have, you will have elevated CO2 levels. It's not good for your health and it's not good for your system's health either. So, yeah. 
Uh, Matt asks, can you have two buckets running air stones, one in the room, one outside, determine if CO2 is in the room? I reckon that'll work, yeah. Yep, I reckon it'll work, because if you had the air pump pumping air into the bucket, you would have a depressed CO2 versus something that's outside. Having said that, if you test your alkalinity and you test your pH and then you use a CO2 pH KH table, you will be able to get an indication of how much CO2 is in your water. Would a CO2, CO2 scrubber be effective enough if there was also a calcium reactor? Well, isn't that a loaded question, Zoe? <laughs> um, there's two things here. Um, if the CO2 within the calcium reactor is being eaten up completely, whether it's a single or a dual chamber CO2 uh, calcium reactor, then arguably you will have very high alkalinity, very low CO2 water coming out of the outlet of the calcium reactor. Now, if you have excess CO2 coming out of the calcium reactor effluent, um, then it is going to put a load on the system a CO2 scrubber is only going to be treating the air going into the fractionator though and not the CO2 laden in the water that might be coming out of the calcium reactor. I'm sorry, I've just got a massive cramp. Um, so that would it would have an impact on pH. Um, a CO2 scrubber would not have an impact on that impact of the pH that, that dissolved CO2 would have if there's any extra left over. Um, having said that, if there was CO2 in the water and it's going through the calcium reactor, that is then going to assist in lowering the pH, like the pH won't have to drop. You won't have to use as much CO2 gas to get to the lower pH within the calcium reactor to result in the dissolution of the calcium carbonate material within the reactor. So it may actually, in a roundabout's way, help you with your, um, with your calcium reactor. Um, but if there's CO2 going into your water from the ethylon of the calcium reactor, then um, there's nothing you can do about it except for wind back your CO2 in your system and pass out a trickle filter maybe. Um, a CO2 scrubber is only going to affect the air being sucked into the foam fractionator. Unless of course that that CO2 is being gassed off into the facility and that air is floating around and then getting sucked in by the venturi on the protein skimmer, then it will increase the load on the CO2 scrubber, but it will also get removed by the CO2 scrubber. So, yeah. So, um, rule number one, know what your total water volume is. Rule number two, um, know what your bioload is. Uh, rule number three, size to a two minute dwell time, an accurate two minute dwell time after taking into account one, air displacement, and two, mixing as well. There, there's certain ratios that you can, and, and calculations that you can use to, um, determine how much extra percentage on top of the uh, protein schema that you need to allow for, to allow for accurate mixing to prevent short circuiting. Um, and then three, by, by quality components. It's, it's pretty much that simple. It is, it is, you know, there are, there are, there are nuances to sizing up the, the protein schema. Um, if at all possible, use ozone. It's, like the number one thing that I would recommend that anyone apply to an aquatic system. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, that's, that's uh, what I'd recommend. Um, 
And, uh, yeah, I, I'd really love to see a, a standardised system for uh, sizing and um, and uh, applying protein scans. Um, for internal ones, you're going to be restricted, obviously, because you can only regulate it so far, but um, it's still be good to know what the, what the dwell time would be. Um, yeah, it's essentially taking uh, effective technology and shrinking it, and uh, I just, there's that many unknowns because you don't have the data with aquarium and things that you just can't reliably tell how to compare them. So, the way I get around is <laughs> building the self. Um, but yeah. Um, what effects would forcing air into the venturi cause? Um, okay, so a venturi is only going to be able to handle the amount of air that a venturi can handle um, to an extent. So when you have a Mazzy venturi or a venturi injector that you pump water through, it is only going to produce as much suction as it can produce. If you have a aspirating venturi or a suction venturi on a needle wheel, um, the amount of air that it can suck in is directly proportionate to the pressure head of water above it. So you'll get more air suction if you have 10 centimetres water in the skimmer than you have we will have if the if the if the protein skimmer is full, obviously. So by pumping air into that venturi to increase the differential pressure to allow the venturi to work against the force of gravity of water above it might be beneficial. Maybe. Maybe. It'll be a fine line though. But maybe. Um, I have seen very ill-designed skimmers using needle wheels that required the use of an air pump for them to actually function properly because the people that built them didn't actually build them properly. Um, and that, that required the application of an air pump. It shouldn't have, but it did require the application of an air pump because the water column was simply too high. You, you, you've got a very low pressure suction in a, in a needle wheel that has no capable suction head really above it, trying to draw air against the pressure of a gravity column of water within the protein skimmer to actually suck that air in to inject it into the protein skimmer. Now, if you look at if you look at any commercial protein skimmer that aquarium companies make that have needle wheels as their form of air injection, you'll probably notice that those air pumps are halfway up the column or maybe a little bit higher. Or they're, they're definitely not on, on, on the slab. They're definitely not on the bottom, equal to the, to the bottom of the reaction chamber. And that's physically because the, the pumps can't suck enough air down against the force of the water above them. And that's, that's another downfall of needle wheel of injuries. Um, yeah. that's, that's pretty much it. Uh, for a commercial application, obviously. For, for a hobbyist system, the amount of water above it isn't substantial, so although it still does affect it, it doesn't affect it as much. Um, yeah. Any other questions, guys? Got 10 people watching and only a few commenting.
No worries, mate. Anyone else have any questions? Ash, haven't heard from you. Obviously, you'd have a question. Anya, you're watching. I know you are. Do you have a question? Is Cam with you? Does Cam have a question? No worries, Derek. As I said, um, I would welcome uh, a chat anytime, mate. Um, please feel free to drop me a, a, a private message or anything like that, and I'd be happy to um, to have a chat at any time. Be very interesting, very beneficial. Does anyone have any problems with any protein skimmers that they've applied in the past or that they have seen or that they are experiencing currently that maybe they just can't troubleshoot? Uh, yeah, you you want to run it close to it, um, and this comes back to my talk on probiotics and the um, assimilatory versus dissimilatory nitrate reduction um, and the removal of phosphate via assimilatory pathways. So bio pellets are a aerobic uh, process. So. You're tumbling them, you've got a lot of oxygen in there, they're not aerobic, it's the flow's going past them, they're getting oxygen, and the heterotrophic bacteria are using that oxygen and the nitrate and the phosphate and you know um, um, electron donors and electron acceptors and, and, and all their other food sources to bind that nitrate and phosphate into their cell structure to create more cells to grow. As those biopellets are exfoliating against each other, that bacteria is coming off. And to get rid of that nitrate and phosphate, you then need to harvest that bacteria. That bacteria is very effectively pulled out by a skimmer. And the more directly you can get that bacterial laden water into the skimmer, the better your removal will be. So yes, run it into the inlet, run the outlet of the reactor into the inlet of the skimmer. If you can run it directly into the skimmer rather than just direct it towards the suction inlet of the skimmer pump, that is even better. So in a recirculating skimmer, if you by chance find a reactor that has a suitable flow for the recirculating skimmer that you have, ideally at a two minute dwell time, ideally sized to the volume of the system and the biomass, then you are golden. Um, benefits of wet or dry skim. Okay, so wet skimming will uh, obviously produce more skimmate, which will pull out more waste. And generally speaking, if people are running bio pellets, they want to wet skim because they want to rip out more bacteria. Um, dry skimming, it's going to concentrate the amount of waste that you have. Will it pull out as much? Uh, arguably, theoretically not, because you're physically not producing as much skinate and not ripping out as, as much stuff. Um, wet skim or dry skim will also be affected by the filtration components that you put on there. You could be dry skimming and not change a single setting on your protein skimmer, but then start adding organic carbon via bio pellets or MF3P or 4X or vodka vinegar sugar dosing or whatever it might be, and your skimming will actually change from dry skimming to wet skimming because of the, the, the attributes of the water and the bubble physically change to change the, the type of waste that the protein skimmer is producing. So... It's also got to do with how your system runs. If your system runs better with dry skimming, run it dry skimming. If it runs better with wet skimming, run it wet skimming. Um, yeah. Um, 
if I had to choose, what's your favourite brand and why? Oh man, I was hoping no one would ask this question. Um, long story short, I don't have a favourite brand. I assess the application of a protein skimmer in an aquarium application based on the merits of that particular skimmer for that particular system size. No one company is going to have a perfect skimmer for every application. Although, <laughs> um, if I had my way and I could, I could build them myself and build them with the specifications that were required to standardise the application of these protein skimmers, um, I would ensure that you know, that there was one for every application sized correctly to what it was supposed to do. Um, then you come down to hardware choices, you come down to pump choices, you come down to, you know, pump longevity, you come down to the quality of the welding of the acrylic, you come down to the aesthetic look of it, which, look, at the end of the day is very important. You know, first is functionality for me, but secondly, I don't want something that looks like dog shit. <laughs> Honestly, like, you know, um, to put it bluntly, you know, you don't want something that looks like crap um, sitting in your sump and you spend, you know, hundred, not hundreds of thousands, you know, you spend thousands of dollars on these setups and you don't want, you know, you don't want a crap looking skimmer, even though, you know, it's pulling out crap and it does look crap if it's not clean, you don't, you know, you want, you know, some sexy looking bit of kit in there. Um... Having said that, where I work, we, we sell RK2 foam fractionators for commercial applications. So that's what we'll always put in. So I choose those. They are they are an industry-leading brand. Um, they are arguably, quote-unquote, an industry standard because they are, you know, designed and sized correctly. Um, so, yeah, it's... I, I can't answer that question. I honestly can't. Um, and if I did have a favourite brand, which I don't, but if I did and I said what that brand was, it would inevitably piss people off. So even if I did have it, I wouldn't say it. Um, because I think every brand has its merits. Um, but I think without a doubt, almost every brand on the market today does not size their skimmers according to an industry standard that, as I have said, is desperately needed. Because there's no benchmark. There's absolutely no benchmark. Um, who will win the state of origin this year? New South Wales, of course, bags. Please don't even start this. Just don't. I'll get Lance Lee on here. He'll pull you in the line. Oh dear. Does anyone else have any questions at all? Obviously about anything. I'm, I'm happy to answer questions about anything because I think we've pretty much covered a, a, a lot of the, uh, that, that's, look, if I'm being honest, that's pretty much tip of the iceberg for protein skimmers. There's so much more I could go into, but in relation to the information that's available out there for you guys specifically for the aquarium industry, that's like, I think I've given you enough to think about. CO2 level to aim for, zero. If we're talking about stabilising pH in a reef aquarium system or a saltwater aquarium system, zero. Um, if I'm talking an aquaculture system, I'd want to see it sub 15 milligrams per litre. Um, but um, when you're talking about, um, you know, stabilising pH, 
really anywhere below five parts per million is great because that's going to see you, you know, up there on the pH scale. Um, yeah. That's, that's what I'd be aiming for. And I mean, you know, CO2 levels, you know, lower CO2 levels favour aragonite production versus calcite production. It favours the uh, more, um, it, it favours easier metabolic processes for your coral. Um, yeah, it's, it's brilliant. No worries, Jules. I'll catch you. Um, I think if, uh, if no one else has any questions, I think we might call it a night there, guys. Um, I'm quite happy to answer any other questions that anyone has. Um, but we've we've been going for our two and a half hours now, and um, I think we've 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 covered what needs to be covered at this point in time. As I said, I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, you can reach me at uh, gareth at pureaquatics.com.au, so that's G-A-R-E-T-H at pureaquatics, P-U-R-E-A-Q-U-A-T-I-C-S dot com dot A-U if you have any questions. Um, and uh, look, I'm happy to, happy to talk on the group as well, or um, via private messenger, um, if you guys wanted to talk as well. Um, or, you, you know, uh, I'm happy to stay on for an extra five to ten minutes if anyone else has any other questions uh, regarding protein skimmers or anything else for that matter. Nighty night, Zoe. Catch you next time. All right, guys, well, it looks like um, we don't have any more questions. Thank you very much, Matt. Um, look, I'll, I'll, I'll take suggestions for the next um, live stream subject, um, and if I have any expertise in it, I will by all means um, engage. So, yeah, if, you, uh, if anyone has any ideas, let me know in the group and we'll go from there. All right, we'll call it a night. Um, everyone stay safe. Um, social distance, wear a mask, be sensible. Um, and uh, I hope everyone uh, is uh, not being affected by this too much and we'll catch up soon. Thanks very much. <laughs>